How's it going everyone? Uh, today's podcast is going to uh, sort of touch on the future of farming. Um, it's mainly going to be sort of my thoughts about it really. I'm not going to go too deep into it because I think it's quite a, a vast um, topic and you know I'm I'm no expert so I can't give information that comes from a farmer's point of view I'm just giving my own point of view so <clears throat> um, some of it might not be 100% accurate because I, I don't have experience in farming but it's just my thoughts um, about it and having investigated and looked into um, farming subsidies it kind of got me thinking that the the farming system is quite fragile and it, the the way we do things in general in everyday life is changing quite a lot you know in other parts of life so you know farming is also evolving and you know you're starting to see these sort of pop-ups and these these startups should i say rather um of young farmers who are using innovation and technology to change the way farming happens on more of an urban scale rather than a rural scale and it's quite interesting and you know I follow uh, a few uh, sort of urban market gardeners on YouTube um, the one I follow the most is someone called Curtis Stone um, he makes some incredible videos he's really insightful very clever and he runs a profitable farm farming in people's gardens um, and it's just mind-blowing because he's basically changed the way I think um, on how food can be produced and that's part of also what got me interested in the future of farming. Um, so I've brought up a few examples online that I'm going to talk about and my thoughts on them um, and you know just take it from there. So I hope you enjoy today's episode. Okay so I'm um, having a look at this first website that I'm on. It's called growbristol.co.uk. So I live in Gloucestershire in England and Bristol is not very far from where I am, you know maybe about an hour's drive and so these people, this company, has that they farm in a big warehouse in in the city centre in Bristol. So it says here, Grow Bristol is a new urban farming enterprise that is developing innovative and sustainable ways of growing food in the city for the benefit of all its inhabitants and the wider world. We are creating a new kind of market gardening with hydroponic vegetable production in city spaces not normally suited to agriculture. Now obviously hydroponic growing has been around for a, a long time and possibly even, you know, maybe this was a big thing years ago and I just obviously wasn't aware of it because it wasn't in the front of my mind. Um, but there's quite a few places all over the UK and all over the world that are turning to this sort of model where they um, have old buildings um, in city centres that aren't being used and they um, start producing uh, vegetables using hydroponics. Um, so let's just take a look. Smart urban farming. Um, a bit more about this Grow Bristol. So it's an innovation uh, where innovation and business meet to bring environmental, economic and social benefits to the community. Our goal is to produce fresh, local, sustainable food year round while educating and engaging with people. We believe this pro approach increases people's well-being, promotes enterprise and develops employment opportunities. Um, and they also believe that it's a solution to big challenges. Uh, so these stats I'm about to tell you now are all based on stats here in the UK. So it says here, 95% of produce is at risk due to climate change and increased food security. And this is something that also interests me about the future of, of farming because of climate change. You know, um, with things going the way they are, some of the food that we're used to having on our plates might not be available in the very near future um, because of erratic weather conditions and changing climate patterns in certain parts of the world. Um, you know, we've certainly seen that recently with uh, the pretty crazy hurricanes that have been hitting um, America, or, well, yeah, America. Um, the next stat here, so 1,800 miles, the average distance traveled by a lettuce to a UK dinner plate. That seems quite a lot to me. Obviously, I'm you know I'm not saying that they they're lying, but you know unless a lot of our lettuce comes from abroad, which I'm sure a lot of it does, um, that's pretty crazy. That's a very far way for a lettuce to travel before we make a salad out of it. Um, it's not very sustainable. It's um, 
you know, it's not very good, basically, especially when lettuce is an incredibly easy vegetable to grow in your own garden. Uh, next one, 130 litres is the amount of water it takes to produce one kilogram of lettuce. Again, that's, you know, ludicrous. It's, um, again, not very sustainable with the way things are going. And the last one, 60% of all UK produce is imported into the UK, increasing our reliance on food for others. Now, with um, sort of Brexit happening at the moment, um, which I touched on a bit in the EU farming subsidies podcasts, um, we don't know what's going to happen. It's very uncertain. Um, it might, you know, I'm sure we will still have trade deals with countries in, in Europe, but how much is food going to increase? Will food increase? Will there be extra tariffs on importing food? Um, you know, there's a possibility that we might start getting food from different parts of the world and, you know, get deals with them. So, you know, maybe it doesn't mean anything. But these four statistics are, I'm sure, very similar to all places around the world um, where food is becoming or it's becoming more and more of a problem to produce food ethically, economically, um, and on a scale that can feed the growing population all over the world. Um, if we take, quick, uh, take a quick look at what Grow Bristol produce, um, it's basically a mixture of greens, uh, microgreens, so let's see here, our greens, super microgreen salad mix. So it's a mix of our greens to bring you a fresh, tasty, and colorful salad. I'm not gonna get into too much of that, that's basically what it is. Uh, let's see, micro coriander. Again, that's a microgreen. A, a lot of chefs and sort of high-end restaurants use these kind of things for garnishes and for extra flavors and stuff in their salads. Uh, sunflower shoots. Again, that's a microgreen. Um, next one, micro leek. Another microgreen. Um, let's, uh, let's see. So it's basically greens that they produce, um, which. I'll touch on again a bit later because the, the next company I'm going to speak about does something quite similar. And they are called Grow Up Urban Farms. I believe they are based in London, but I'll read a bit about them. Uh, Grow Up Urban Farms is committed to, committed to feeding people in cities in a way that is positive for communities and the environment today and in the future. We produce sustainable fresh fish, salads and herbs in cities using a combination of aquaponic and vertical growing technologies. We lower the environmental impact of agriculture by building and operating farms that take up unused urban space and use it to grow produce. Through the use of aquaponic technology and protected cropping, we can produce a year-round harvest of fresh, leafy vegetables and fish. We're changing the way food is grown and distributed in cities, and we're reconnecting people with the story of food from farm to fork. So, very similar sort of ethos to uh, Grow Bristol. Um, it's sort of... A similar principle in the terms in terms of how they produce stuff. I'm not too sure if Grow Bristol use aquaponics, but um, I think was, theirs was more hydroponics. So the idea of aquaponics is they've got massive tanks of fish um, that all their the um, their excretions are sort of filtered through and used to feed um, the leafy greens, and in turn they also use the fish to sell as food. Now that might be not massively accurate, but that's a, a basic idea of what aquaponics is. Um, if you are watching this video on YouTube, this picture here kind of shows you the idea of what's going on. There's just massive, massive racks kind of going all the way, it looks to the ceiling, with, you know, sort of LED lighting and rows and rows of leafy greens. Um, they produce a bit more variety compared to Grow Bristol. So they've got uh, pea shoots, which again is kind of like a microgreen, uh, kale mix, watercress, uh, herbs, so different kinds of herbs, Thai basil, holy basil, uh, I never heard of that in my life. Um, and again, microgreen, so uh, a, a radish mix, micro coriander and sunflower shoots. Now, there's two things I want to touch on when it comes to what these sorts of projects or enterprises are doing. Um, first of all is infrastructure. So they have to spend an incredible amount of money in setting something like this up. Um, it takes up, you know, sort of, I suppose, a warehouse space. Now, that might not be their biggest sort of um, cost because you can often get, you know, warehouses for, you know, relatively cheap if you're renting or even buying. But all the lighting is and all the, the, the kit that they need to set up, are highly, it's highly specialized, not just stuff you can go buy in the shop. 
Um, so I, I, I'm not 100% sure on the cost involved. I haven't really researched that that much, but I can imagine it costs an incredible amount of money. So either they are getting, you know, there might be crowdfunding, they might be, you know, just going down traditional lending methods, so going to banks, things like that, um, or they are using their own money, or, you know, they're getting um, venture capitalist money. I don't know how, where they're getting the money from, but they've got to come up with money, probably, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds to set up, or dollars, wherever you are in the world. And the other thing is, I've noticed, now not just with these two companies, but a few others that I've looked at that are quite similar, they are limited in the kind of food they can produce. First of all, because they're doing it hydroponically or aquaponically, um, and you can't grow a lot of food in that method. You can grow leafy greens and things that don't necessarily res rely on having soil. So, you know, like staple things like carrots, potatoes, you know, anything that grows in the ground, basically. Um, and it, it's... The, the, these things that they are producing are often high profit earners. So they are relatively inexpensive to grow in terms of buying the seeds. Um, they get a massive amount of yield per square foot. They don't grow massively in terms of height. So um, they don't necessarily have to have loads of space between the racks, even if they're going vertically. Um, it's probably really easy to um, maintain that the health of these plants and they can sell them for quite a lot especially you know microgreens where top chefs all over the world are paying a lot of money for you know these very pretty looking things so for example here um on growup.org.uk spicy mixed micro radish there's also sorts of different colors you know there's like purple um leaves and green ones you know, micro coriander, they've got a completely different shaped leaf. Sunflower shoots, again, also very different. And, you know, chefs like using this stuff to tart up their dishes and make it look very nice. Um, and the other thing is these things grow very quickly. You know, some, some greens can grow from seed to harvest in, in a month. You know, so the turnover of this stuff is incredibly fast. Um, and they can pump stuff out really quickly everyone eats greens and they probably make a relatively good amount of money from them. The criticism I have about it is leafy greens and herbs and microgreens aren't really going to feed the masses. Um, they're not staple foods. You know, people, there are certain foods, that, the vegetables that people might buy every week. So if you if, if, if you live um, in a part of the world where, you know, they're eating lots of stews and soups, you're not going to use greens. You're going to use things like um, carrots, potatoes, turnips, root vegetables, um, and all sorts of other things. So I think what they're doing is really good and it's innovative um, and it's bringing food closer to people, but it's limited in the sense that they can't produce everything or a wide variety of, of vegetables that the general public will want to have every week. Okay, but you know, don't don't get me wrong. I don't think I'm not sort of criticizing it in that sense. But th those are the the first two things that strike me. Is first of all, it's incredibly expensive to start something like this. Um, and yes, you know, you might be able to start small in your in your garage or in a in someone's you know extra room in some way that they rent, but in order for it to become profitable, you obviously need a lot more space. You need to produce more. So it's a lot of money to set up. And the, and the fact that it's quite limited on what it can produce, um, I think, is is a downside to this way of farming. So is this the future of farming? Well, it, it's happening now. So it, a part of it must be, it, you know, that we're going to start moving towards this sort of way of farming. And I thought about it and I thought, well, there must be a reason why this is happening. So in my opinion, um, the first one is land. You know, traditionally farming is done in the ground on, you know, massive farms, acres and acres and acres of land. Um, now in the UK, I don't know what it's like anywhere else in the world, access to agricultural land is very expensive and it's not always easy for a startup farm or a farmer to, to just get a whole bunch of land stock growing on. Um, and the other thing that makes me think this is going to become more popular is that the population in the world is growing. Um, we need more place for humans to live. Um, so as the population increases, we're going to be forced to encroach on green belts and green land all over the world to produce housing for people to live in. 
Um, and there's there's already a massive uproar about that kind of thing here in the UK. People get really angry when you know developers buy up land and and you know land that was once farm or forest or you know sort of uh, beautiful walks are being turned into houses. Um, I'm kind of not. I've got an opinion about that, but in a way it's sad but you know we need places for people to live so the more and more rural land decreases it becomes more difficult to get and increases in price um this is going to become more commonplace people will start farming like this um to get around the fact that they might not be able to have land the second reason is obviously with climate change in these environments they can um, control everything they can regulate humidity temperature light bugs everything they can stop using pesticides and herbicides because they don't um you know they, they can have like a completely secure area where these kind of things can't get in so you know that that's a, another thing they've got more control over the environment whereas we don't have control over the weather so this is going to become more popular and or even a version of this I still think this kind of idea is in its infancy in the sense that um, they will need to get around growing other vegetables other than leafy greens. So whether or not they almost move the farm indoors and they, they build almost like a polytunnel, you could say, or a big greenhouse, that might be what they do. Or they have massive raised beds indoors and they go vertical with lights and they can grow vegetables like that. Maybe that, that might be the option. But um this is certainly, I think, going to be part of some way of the future of farming. Now, the other, the other thing I want to speak about of what I think the future of farming could possibly be revolves around um, changing the way we farm in terms of how we do it, the technology that's used, and, and changing the way we think about it. Now, um, someone I want to speak about a bit more is someone called John Martin Fortier. He's a, a Canadian farmer. And um, him, along with uh, Curtis Stone, are the two that I know the most, two farmers I know the most about. Now, they have completely changed the way I think farming can work. And I'll read a bit on his website here. Um, Jean Martin Fortier says, There has never been a better time to get into farming. He says, why not replace mass agriculture with agriculture by the masses? The problems of modern agriculture are numerous, but the solutions, not so much. Local organic uh, agriculture can and will transform society in positive ways, but the limiting factor is our numbers. Our world needs more small-scale farmers. Feeding people locally is hard work, but it can be part of a fulfilling lifestyle with a deep sense of connection with the land and the community. I propose that we work together by growing the pie, inviting more people to our tables, all while refining our craft by continuously finding and sharing more efficient ways of running human scale farms. Now that to me, that phrase human scale farms is particularly interesting because the way farming works now, it's not really human scale. They've got massive, massive machines and huge tractors and all, you know, combine harvesters. That's not human scale. That's one little farmer sitting in a massive combine harvester, harvesting loads and loads of stuff by themselves. Um, and it's often, you know, monocultures. So they're just, they can only harvest one, one, th uh, not monocultures, um, uh, like mo mo monocrop, sorry, they can only harvest one thing at a time on massive pieces of land. Um, so when he says human scale farms, he's referring to having smaller farms actually run by people that are actually farming the land, harvesting stuff by themselves, using less, less machinery, intensifying what you can grow on smaller spaces. So, my goal is to share the tools, techniques, and inspiration for you to succeed as a market gardener, grow amazing produce for your family and community, all while making a lucrative small business out of it. There's a lot of opportunity out there, with, and with some enthusiasm and the right met method methodology, sorry, <laughs> you can make this happen. I strongly believe there has never been a better time to get into farming. Um, 
So a bit about uh, Jeremy Fortier. Uh, he is a farmer, educator, and author specializing in organic and biologically intensive cropping practices. His award-winning book, The Market Gardener, which I'm actually reading at the moment, has inspired tens of thousands of readers worldwide to reimagine human-scale food systems. His message is one of empowerment in order to educate, encourage, and inspire people into pursuing a farming career and lifestyle. He is a founder with his wife, um, of Les Jardins de la, I can't pronounce that, <laughs> it's his name of his farm, an internationally recognized 10 acre micro farm in Quebec, Canada. With only one and a half acres cultivated in permanent beds, the farm grosses more than $100,000 per acre, with operating margins of about 60%, enough to financially sustain his family. The focus at his farm, like I said, I can't pronounce that, has been to grow better, not bigger, in order to optimize the cropping system, making it more lucrative and viable in the process. Uh, so in this, he's got a, a new um, farming project called Femme des Quat... Oh, again, I can't, it's a French name, I can't pronounce that. Um, he has set out to further demonstrate how diversified small-scale farms using regenerative and economically efficient agricultural practices can produce a higher nutri nutritional quality of food and more profitable farms. This farm is a model uh, includes livestock raised according to holistic management principles and incorporates permaculture design into its operations. Beyond offering a new model for polyculture farming in Quebec, the farm is training a new cohort of young farmers with the intention of giving them the know-how, experience and resources to start their own innovative agricultural product projects. Um, if you go on YouTube, you will find loads of videos about this guy and what he's done. Um, you'll be able to see a lot um, about his farm and how they do everything. Um, it's very similar to how Curtis Stone operates, um, although Curtis Stone also sticks to a very few amount of crops that are high rotation, high profit, high with high profitability um, and quick turnaround. Uh, I think he farms on about a quarter of an acre, Curtis Stone. I might be um, in incorrect about that, but he's got a YouTube channel with loads and loads of videos. And again, um, I think he said in the past he makes about $100,000 a year in sales on like a quarter of an acre. It's incredible. It's, it's such a small space, but he uses the same system. Um, it's all done by hand. He's got very limited machinery that doesn't cost a lot of money in people's back gardens in Canada. Um, so here's another example of how farming of the future might be. These farmers are changing the way they operate. They are going down to human scale rather than having acres and acres of land. They're employing people, um, more people, and they are, it's almost like going back in time a bit. They're kind of going back to older farming methods. Um, which is interesting, but they are doing it in such a way that they can produce a lot of food and make it profitable. Now, um, again, if you've uh, watched some of the or listened to the podcast on EU um, farming subsidies, a lot of farmers don't make any money from farming. And these are the farmers that have got a lot of land that are doing kind of one crop at a time with wide bed spacing, using massive tractors to harvest everything. They don't make much money, whereas um, these people are um taking things down the scale on the small amount of land um and making more money than farmers have imagined making in a long time uh, let's just take a look here at these farms i don't want to look at that oh, i'll close it all down now but yeah uh here's another quote from a uh podcast studios on today i uh, this is jean martin 48 by the way today i'm talking to someone who is killing it farming 1.5 acres he's doing un over one hundred forty thousand dollars in sales and one and a half acres supporting himself and his family in the process of that one hundred forty thousand dollars forty percent is profit that's like 50 over 50 grand fifty five thousand dollars more or less uh, compare that to corn and soybeans, which net about $280 an acre. And he is grossing that 140000 working nine months a year and average length work days. We aren't talking about burnout workload here. Think about that. $800 per acre versus $90,000. Um, now, this is quite a, an old article, I think. So this was on his first farm. It's slightly changed now. And from what I've seen, this new farm that he started 
um, is been a lot of hard work because they've had to set everything up. Um, they've had people invest in them who are interested in, in the way they are farming. Um, so it might be slightly different now compared to what this is, but this just gives you an example of how much money they're actually making. Now, these are the only two sort of examples I'm going to speak about. So on the one hand, you've got uh, like a new generation of farmer that are growing stuff indoors in incredibly controlled environments and um, using completely new technology to what's done before and they um, are becoming quite popular and they, they're making money. On the other hand, you've got people that are farming in more of a traditional sense but on a smaller scale um, and they are also making money. Now, the one thing I prefer In, in, in this in the second way of farming is that you're still connected to the land now I know that sounds really hippy dippy you know and it's a bit like you know tree hugger but our food has always come from the soil and when you remove it from the soil and grow it in in an almost uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, clinical environment I just feel people lose that connection with their food yes you might be growing stuff closer to where people are and they can therefore be more connected to their food but you lose connection with where our food has come from and traditionally that comes from the earth now yes with global warming that might not be the case for very much longer but it, I just think it's a bit sad um, that that you know growing food in a big warehouse might be where we, where all our food will come from eventually. And the second kind of comparison I'd like to make between these two different methods is the, is it the barrier to entry? Um, yeah, the barrier to entry. Now, if you wanted to start a farm in a warehouse using aquaponics and, um, hydroponics and you know controlled environments like I said you will need an incredible amount of money now whether or not a bank is just going to throw money at you maybe not because it's this is still brand new and it, they don't know if, it, if it's going to work now banks might not be or might be reluctant to lend money to uh, an enterprise that isn't 100% tied, tried and tested this isn't the norm you know this kind of farming isn't happening everywhere so that's the first barrier to entry is is how much money it's going to cost to set up and i can tell you one thing um i own my own business and so does my wife and we've had to take on money you know lend money to, to start them and even though it's not a huge amount it's still really scary now we are in our 30s and we have got you know this business debt to start a business which is you know most businesses have to start like that but i would certainly not like to have any more than what we have right now to start farming in this way um it scares the crap out of me now unless you've got people that are financing it that might be different because you're not using you know your own money or you don't have to pay it back necessarily that you know maybe you could you sort of raise money that way like venture capital or by crowdfunding um you know, so that, that, that's the one sort of barrier to entry with this kind of farming. The other one is obviously finding a warehouse or a place to do it. Now, that might not be the most difficult thing because there's a lot of unused sort of um, buildings all over the place. You're always There's always going to be warehouses that are free at a relatively low cost to get to. Um, the other barrier to entry is how difficult it would be to set all of this kind of stuff up. I again I don't know that much about it I haven't looked into it but I can imagine it is incredibly difficult and you've got to be very precise everything needs to be perfect all the equipment needs to be done set up correctly all the temperatures need to be monitored you'll probably have to have loads of kit uh, measuring temperature all that kind of thing and you know I think you would need to be very very wise on this subject matter to be able to do it properly and especially when you lending or, or trying to get a lot of money to start out, you don't want to mess around. It's going to have to be um, perfect from the onset. Now, the, the, that's probably you know the the main barriers to entry to this, I suppose. Now, with the um, with setting up a farm on the more traditional way, um, th there are other barriers to entry which are slightly different. Now, there's less of an issue with 
money because you don't need to have that much machinery. All you need is a place to farm. So if you are lucky enough to have a big garden, you could probably just start in your back garden, you know, or you could find other gardens to, to grow stuff in. And that's exactly what Curtis Stone did. He is in Kelowna, I think, in Canada. And he uh, started growing stuff and still does in his garden, but in other people's gardens. And the way he pays for them is by giving these people um, fresh vegetables every week for as long as he's got vegetables um, being produced. So you don't have to worry about getting land. Um, your setup costs are a lot, lot less. Now, if I can find it, I will put it up on the screen, but Curtis Stone and John Martin Fortier have both sort of done some calculations on how much more or less you would need to start farming straight away to start making money. And um, it, it's sort of between 10 and 20,000 Canadian dollars, I think it was. Now, that's not that much money. It's a lot of money, especially if you haven't got it or if you've got no means of lending it. Um, but there's less of a risk involved. Um, you know, the other barrier to entry, I think, is although you still have to learn how to farm, you won't just be able to do it. I think there's less less to learn in, in, in this sort of way of farming. You literally need to put seeds in the ground um, and you know look after them properly, water them properly, put them, you know, space them at the right uh, at the right distances, plant them at the right time, water them correctly, you know, put the right kind of nutrients in the soil and you should be okay. And it's probably something that you can learn quite quickly by watching stuff online. Um, whereas you know, there's lots of information about traditional farming methods and less so on aquaponics um, and uh, hydroponics. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure there are, but it, it, you'll have to learn a lot more of the ins and outs and the scientific side of it. So um, that's all I kind of want to speak about, really. Just, just it's it, For me, it's quite thought-provoking. You have these two different ways of farming where you're doing stuff indoors, aquaponics, you know, um, using, you know, light cycles and, you know, very sterile sort of environments. And you've got two farmers that are farming in a completely different way on, on small pieces of land, but they're intensifying what they farm and how they farm and the yields they're getting on that land. Um, they are completely different to each other. And I don't know which one or which one of these is going to be the future of farming or if any of these are going to be the future of farming. Um, but I do think that a combination of these two might be the way things could head. Now, uh, I've read up online and seen pictures of, you know, automated combine harvesters and, you know, kind of mechanizing farming further, but I just don't, you know, to feed the masses, that's probably going to have to be some sort of future in farming you know we have to farm a lot of food to feed all the people there but i do think if more people like jean martin fortier says if more people are farming on smaller scales everywhere that will certainly make a massive difference to how food is produced and, how, and where we get our food from and i think it's starting to happen slowly i think you know farming's becoming a bit more hip you know, there's more people interested in it. More people want to know that their food's coming from a local source um, and it's grown organically and ethically and sustainably. Um, and if there is a market for that kind of thing, people will start farming in that way. Um, so, you know, that that's basically what I wanted to speak about, these two different contradicting methods. And, I, you know, I might look a bit more into it um, I'd, I'd love to find people to interview that do this kind of thing, but it's really difficult because I'm, I'm short of time. I don't can't always go out there and find people to, to, to talk to this about, talk about this kind of stuff too. But possibly, you know, I might be able to go down to Bristol. It's not very far from here. And I know that uh, Grow UK or whatever it was in London, they've got open days where people can go and interview them. So it'll be interesting to hear what they say. <clears throat> so I hope um, you enjoyed listening to this and I hope you learned something new. Um, it just, I think it's important for us to think about where the future of our food is or what the future of our, our farming is because it affects everyone. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed today's uh, podcast. Um, I just kind of touched on the subject very, uh, on a very sort of basic level, but it's um, certainly something that we should all be thinking about, I think. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to watch this closely because I definitely think in the next sort of five to 10 years, even sooner than that, um, farming 
and the way we farm is going to change drastically in, in all senses of the word so on on a larger scale in in the traditional sense of farming you know the, like i said there's more mechanization more automated um sort of harvesting methods using um what's that stuff called a gps and that kind of thing um in terms of growing stuff in warehouses using aquaponics and you know fancy sort of things and also um intensifying farming on smaller scales so i think they're all really interesting and it's going to be one to watch so hopefully i'll do some more episodes and um about you know how farming is progressing and what implications that will have for us so I will see you guys next time. Um, if you want to carry on listening to these podcasts and watching these videos, um, subscribe to the channel and subscribe to the podcast and that would be great. I will see you guys next time. Cheers.